Welcome to the uh, Crypto and Privacy Village on this uh, nice Sunday morning. I uh, appreciate that uh, you got up or stayed up. And uh, we've got uh, a good lineup of uh, speakers today. And uh, we're starting with uh, Ryan Lackey. And he's giving a, a great talk on cyberpunks, or cypherpunks history. Great. Thank you very much. And yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks. And yeah, Sunday morning is always a fun day at DEF CON. Uh, 11.30 is pretty early for me too. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Ryan Lackey. I've been uh, uh, interested in cryptography since probably 1990 when I first discovered it when I was like 11 years old. It was just the thing that immediately drew me to being really excited about the possibilities of mathematics, computer science, everything else. And uh, fortunately for me, I discovered IRC and then I discovered the Cypherpunks mailing list uh, really early on, like a couple months after it got started. Uh, so there's this mailing list that we're going to talk about called the Cypherpunks mailing list. Um, it was founded in 1992. Uh, there are three guys that are individually really famous for a lot of other things, Eric Hughes, Tim, Tim May, and John Gilmore. Uh, they've gone on to do a lot of things. They'd actually done a lot of things beforehand as well. Uh, so it was really a, probably the most interesting place on the internet to discuss um, cryptography, privacy, politics of the sort of techno-libertarian front, um, all sorts of other stuff for the whole 1990s, which was really exciting for me because I was a teenager and got to see all this stuff firsthand. I actually ran one of the first mailing list, mailing list archives for this on my machine at MIT when I was a student, um, which became really interesting legally later. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, just as a quick question, uh, who knows about the cypherpunks? By a show of hands. Okay, so maybe about half the people. Who was on the mailing list in the 1990s? Ah, one person. So this is going to be uh, something that people hopefully are going to be really excited about and then go look into after the fact because it's, it's, it's definitely worthy. Um, so the reason you probably haven't heard of it as much is that it had this uh, sort of like golden age in the 1990s, probably from the list founding in 1992, I think 93, 94, maybe 95 was really the high point of the list where lots of stuff was being discussed. But just as you've seen with other forums on the internet, uh, a lot of stuff came up later and um, uh, sort of made it so that today it's essentially non-existent. Uh, all sorts of ideas, we'll go into these individually and talk about them in a minute, but uh, I just want to describe the, the um, uh, some of the other stuff that happened. There was a lot of politics on the list. Uh, there was bad politics, which I'd say were like internecine warfare, um, who gets to run the, the, uh, the mailing list, uh, a couple court cases, um, trolling and spam like in a weaponized way, like anything you see on, on Twitter or modern stuff. Uh, imagine if you had a centralized mailing list that people were fighting over. Um, so there's a lot of bad politics, but there's also a lot of good politics. It's where people were discussing uh, a lot of the, the big issues of the day, a lot of the legal precedents that exist today with like DMCA, the downfall of the CDA, um, things that are still issues today, ITAR, patents, everything else, were contentious issues there and we didn't really have anything that um, went uh, to, to reference, like no, there was no history of, of these things, so it was the first time. And then all sorts of stuff, this was sort of the founding time of the internet becoming commercialized, going from like NSFNet and uh, a lot of uh, academics to being commercialized, so there were a lot of discussions around that kind of stuff ranging from people that thought government's evil, um, corporations good, free market, whatever, or corporations evil, regulation can help people, and there were like pretty serious debates there. And the, I wouldn't say that debates are, debates are often very good as long as they're constructive, and there were a lot of constructive debates there. Uh, there were a lot of really interesting people there. Um, I don't wanna, there's, I think at the, the peak it was probably about 2,000 people. There were hundreds of people who actively posted on a weekly basis, um, and of those people, I think if you looked at people that were active in the 1990s in crypto, uh, a lot of the people that are still active today were people from that mailing list. There's a lot of professors, there's a lot of people that have gone on to do startups. Uh, I was on the younger side back then. There were a lot of people that were maybe 10 or 20 years older than me that have gone on to be or like tenured professors or VCs or ever, have founded things and even retired at this point. There were some really famous people that we can go into in a minute. Um, but just as a quick step, I'll go back. Uh, I have a mailing list archive that I just about 30 minutes ago put live again. Uh, embarrassingly, I had a web server that had a hard drive that failed. It's still a physical server, not virtualized. And I left it offline for a little while. Um, I put it back online. It's free, uh, accessible. There's a web archive. You can go per message. There's also raw archives of the entire list. So as we discuss these things, you can then go back and search. And I submitted it back again to Google, so it should be searchable by the, the keyword. So if you find a keyword that you find interesting, you should get links on this pretty soon. Um, and I'm. 
I have most of the archives. Uh, Hugh Daniel gave me a lot of copies uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I then lost some of those, and then someone else archived them, so it was like this crazy thing where 600 megs of data was like a big deal back in the mid-90s. Um, but uh, it should be pretty comprehensive, and I have some other ones that I'm adding to it as well. So the thing that's most interesting are there's a lot of ideas that were discussed on the list, and they were discussed over a period of years. Uh, in multiple stages, there were um, initial ideas, and there was really people would, would discuss things in short comments, like one or two line comments, and like reply to a mailing list, but people would also go out and write running code. Uh, the motto of the list is cypherpunks write code. The idea was that you'd have a, um, somebody build a, pro a proof of concept or, or demo something, and you'd actually get to see how it works in practice, rather than spending like years discussing theoretically how something might or might not work. And as a result, you got a lot of really interesting but kind of janky prototypes built. Uh, that were eh, useful somewhat, but then you got other people that said, oh, this is wrong, and instead of just saying, oh, this is wrong, this sucks, they would actually build something better, and it would be sort of this iterative process, which was really interesting, because it was back before uh, startups and commercialization were really the, the way that the internet worked, so you had people that would be just building these projects. Like, I was a student, there were lots of people that were students, there were lots of people that worked for big companies. Uh, uh, Tim May, one of the biggest people on the list, worked for Intel for a while and then was retired, so it was a really fast, like, um, uh, iterative cycle of developing stuff and everything else. Um, and so, yeah, so lots of these, it was very, very fertile for these ideas. Uh, so lots of things were discussed then and then have happened. Uh, these are some of the things that have happened, a few of them that haven't. I'd say onion routing is one of the biggest successes. So the concept of onion routing was discussed on this list and a few other lists in, uh, I think probably about 94, 95 was the earliest. Uh, I've been, I was looking through and there were some academic people um, a Naval Research Laboratories, Paul Syverson and some other people there were working on it. And this is what we now know as TOR. It's gone through a lot of um, evolution. The TOR project now exists. Uh, it sort of got separated out from government. It, but it's been a long process. But this is something where the seeds have been, um, like, they were planted back in the, the 1990s. And this is a tool that's still under active development, active use. And it's probably the best um, system today. It's a system to anonymously or uh, non attributedly connect to, to things. Um, anonymous electronic email was uh, discussed on the list a lot. Remailers, they were, it was one of the uh, most technically advanced things that I saw on the list. Uh, the idea was that you could send uh, email to a server, and then the server would have a pool of messages and would resend them after a certain point. And this is one of those cases of iterative development, where the first version was called a type 1 cypherpunk remailer that really wasn't all that great and had a lot of problems. And then we had mixed master type two remailers that were a lot better, uh, that were built on top of that. And then we had mixed minion type three remailers that were under development. Uh, this was something that uh, Len Sassaman uh, worked on a lot. Unfortunately, he uh, passed away a couple years ago. Uh, the field has largely declined because email has become less of a thing. Like it used to be everyone liked SMTP. They had a lot of separate systems that would interconnect via regular email messages. Now people use instant messengers or on-site messaging like Facebook Messenger or whatever else, which has sort of led to the decline of remailers. It's one of the things that I think is the most underutilized uh, technologies, uh, sort of message-based mixed nets. Um, anonymous eCash. So everything you see about Bitcoin had precedence on the Cypherpunks mailing list. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, this is the one technology that got me interested in crypto and in the cypherpunks. Uh, David Chalm, a professor, an American professor who was working in the Netherlands, developed this, uh, I'd say from like eight, 1983 to 1986. He patented a lot of it. And everything you see about Bitcoin, except for one feature, um, this stuff does better, faster, cheaper, everything else. The only downside is it's an inherently centralized system. It let you can, it's permissionless in that anyone can spin up a server and do whatever they want. But it is each. It lets you set up a currency, but every currency has a server that has to remain online. So, for a lot of reasons, 20-year um, cycle of development, uh, Bitcoin eventually was successful. But the whole promise of blind, uh, blinded transactions, where you can anonymously pay someone a currency or a, a transaction in cash, in app coins, all the stuff that's being discussed today, has been already gone over for years. Prototype built commercially built uh, through DigiCash Incorporated, through a couple other companies, everything else from the 1990s to the 2000s and on. Um, one of the most interesting things that has sort of existed in various forms is uh, black nets. Uh, Tim May created something called BlackNet. It was the sort of the prototype for it. The idea was that if you can, the, the cool thing with all these technologies is you can combine them. Uh, you take uh, remailers and anonymous cash and together you have a way to build a server that lives somewhere that can receive email that you don't know where the physical server is. 
um, receives payment, does something, and sends you back a message. And that's actually more secure than an onion site in a lot of ways uh, because it can be separated out through time. If you have a high latency um, operation, uh, you can very easily send a message and say, oh, it'll take a week to get a response. And that protects you from a lot of things. Um, but he created something that was basically an information market. And the idea was that you could, you could uh, say, I'm, I'm willing to pay X amount of money for, say, the source code to Windows 95 or something. And people would be able to uh, anonymously fund that kind of transaction. Um, we saw that later happen with Bitcoin and then Silk Road and things like that. So it sort of has a precedent there. And information markets where people would, uh, there were all sorts of exciting things like the street performer protocol where you would come up with a bounty for people to create works of art. Um, it's basically Kickstarter. So uh, decentralized cryptographic way. Um, one of the weirdest things was this concept of assassination politics. Uh, it's probably the most inherently negative thing on the list. It's also the thing that um, I had sort of a personal connection to. There was a, it was discussed on the list as like an idea that no one would actually want to do. The idea was that you could create a bounty, so an abet, so you could, you could basically create an assassination market that was a betting market. I predict that certain famous person is going to die on a certain date in a certain way. Obviously the best way to win your bet is to be the one who affects that, that operation. So it's sort of a weird legal hack where you have sort of plausible deniability, never really tested. Um, normal people would think this is a bad idea. Um, unfortunately, or well, it, it's a trait that there were some fairly non-normal people that were attracted to this stuff. One of them, uh, Jim Bell, uh, was, was on the list and I think mentally a little bit unhinged. Um, I never met him in person. Uh, he really was a big fan of this thing and lived in Oregon and incidentally to all that, he published about it and all sorts of other stuff. Incidentally, he set off some stink bombs at the IRS building in, I think, Portland. And there was some prosecution that happened. And for me, this was really relevant because in that court case, they subpoenaed my mailing list archive and they wanted me to testify as uh, to the veracity of the archives and everything else where he described killing federal officials and all sorts of other crazy stuff. Um, I was living in the Caribbean working on an anonymous uh, electronic cash system at the time. And uh, it turns out that you don't want to go to federal court even as a witness. Uh, it's just never a good idea. And they don't really have any power to compel you to show up if you're outside of the US. So I respectfully declined to um, uh, attend uh, and it went and he was prosecuted and went to jail. Um, it was a pretty interesting thing. There's a bunch of fundamental security technology that was discussed, uh, the capabilities security model. Um, this was actually something that existed before the cypherpunks. It existed in, I'd say, about the 80s from some, some cool people that were doing uh, electronic gaming virtual community stuff and then turned it into a really exciting, re it was really, really um, technically powerful but different than the way everyone builds stuff um, security model. Uh, discussed there, self-enforcing contracts. I'd say Nick Zabo, uh, who's in the running for being Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, I'd probably say is one of the top five candidates for it, uh, developed the idea of contracts that you can write that would enforce themselves and would be machine interpretable, which sounds an awful lot like Ethereum or Tezos or any of the modern systems like that. And this was all discussed in like 1997 uh, and built in, as a prototype. Cool things, uh, data stores that were um, essentially uh, turning the internet into a, a block device where you could pay someone to store a certain amount of data that was encrypted that they wouldn't know what it was um, for a period of time with like redundancy striped across a bunch of servers. Uh, sounds a lot like the store coin or the other things that are built today. So cool things like that. Uh, a bunch of secure hardware stuff, uh, lots of discussions of um, HSMs, lots of discussions of secure communications terminals, which at the time were uh, at the very end were like Palm Pilots that people had recognized. So it was really before it was possible to do this kind of stuff. I remember walking around with like a briefcase and a laptop and uh, uh, like a handcuff thing on it. And that was like the secure terminal I could use for cool stuff. Um, the idea of data havens. Uh, I think Bruce Sterling, Islands in the Net novel from the eight, sometime in the 80s, was one of the first people to discuss this. Uh, the idea had existed previously. Um, there was lots of discussion about where to build it, and I actually ended up meeting the co-founders for Haven Co., the offshore data haven that I started uh, on the list, and cool stuff. Um, and then much more useful stuff. This was where debates happened about the SET protocol versus SSL, and you probably have not heard of SET unless you work in banking. Um, so as a result, we got 
uh, and the consensus on the list was, yeah, this other thing is a little bit technically more interesting, but is way more complicated, so it'll never get used. And that's in fact what happened. And then all sorts of secure messaging stuff. Uh, voice encryption, secure terminals using WinCE, all sorts of cool stuff like that. So yeah, it was a pretty exciting place. And now there's a mailing list archive where you can search. There's like 600 gigs of data where you can go and find the initial idea. Um, one of the things I was thinking would be really nice would be if people found prior art for patents that people are um, asserting in the field. Because if something was publicly discussed and prototyped back in the 90s, it clearly shouldn't be patentable by a company today. Um, also, there are probably are ideas that you could build today and turn into a, a working thing that haven't been built yet. So yeah, lots of cool stuff. Um, I would be interested in discussing any of these things with anybody, if anyone has any questions at this point. Um, but, but yeah. Otherwise, I can talk about some of these or persons from the Cyberpunks list. Cool. But thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll repeat the question or whatever, yeah, so. Sure, okay. So secure hardware and HSMs are really interesting. They, the hardware, HSM is a hardware security module. Um, so people used to, this was in the time when doing public key operations was actually a challenging thing for a computer to do. Uh, you would probably tie up your desktop computer, you could do maybe like three to five RSA operations uh, in a second. And if you had a mobile device, it would drain the battery on like a Palm Pilot or something. So there was the idea of using an outboard dedicated processor to do your cryptographic operations. Uh, it would either be a card or a SCSI drive thing that would fit in. Um, they still exist today. There's a lot of reasons to do them. They used to be crypto accelerators. Now they are um, really there for putting hardware protection around a CPU and doing uh, two-factor, hum two-human control and things like that. Um, these have been, they've gone from on every web server, every public facing web server, you'd have a lot of them to now they're very limited in deployment. Like you can use a cloud HSM and Amazon uh, because they're about $30,000 each. So instead of uh, having one big server, which used to be the model with this, uh, it was at the time five to $10,000 box to do the crypto. Now you have like a hundred, $2,000 PCs as your front end. And you might have one of these servers to distribute keys, but in most cases you don't. Um, they are another one of these things that I think was a good idea then that sort of has had a 20 year period of not really doing all the stuff it should do and actually makes sense to do today because now you're using cloud resources where you never actually see the computer you're working on and there's this whole like matrix question of you're talking to a remote server, do you know if you're actually talking to a bare metal server or are you talking to some virtualized environment where someone's monitoring everything and finally people have keys, like there are Bitcoin keys out there that are probably worth $100 million or more where people have a single wallet with lots of stuff and I personally don't ever want to have a key that I have sole authority over with $100 million on it because if I did, I'd have to have a level of physical security at all times equal to that because otherwise you just like kidnap somebody and say like turn over the key or we'll shoot you or shoot somebody else. So this hardware security module idea is becoming more relevant again. Um, I, lo had a, I was looking at building one of these things as sort of like an open source project where you could have an open source HSM container and put an arbitrary board. The problem is they're fundamentally a very niche product right now. I don't know how many are sold per year, but it's definitely under 10,000 a year uh, because they're so expensive. And, as re and they're sold to banks, governments, CAs, people like that that are basically price insensitive. So the costs have just kept going up and they become more niche. It's one of those things where if it were more widely deployed, it would be cool. Uh, Intel SGX, uh, Trusted Enclave stuff, all that stuff is interesting on the client side for it, but unfortunately um, fails some of the hardware requirements if you have physical access to the device. It's pretty, pretty straightforward to attack an S, not super straightforward, but it is, it is feasible to attack a T or an SGX environment if you have physical access to it, if you're willing to do hardware level stuff. And with an HSM, you're not supposed to be able to, although you can, so. Yeah, uh, but yeah, but yeah, that's the HSM market. Um, the thing that was really missing the most from the cypherpunks era was the mobile phone. I think if the, mo if the smartphone had existed back then in any form that had wide area connectivity, even if it was uh, very low bitrate connectivity and a thing that you could carry around as a handheld terminal, I think that would have been 
that would have pushed a lot of this technology about 10 years earlier than it did. And a lot of that stuff was held up for carrier licensing reasons. Like the technology basically existed. There were, like the Scion PDA from a long time ago had a lot of this capability. There were lots of weird restrictions or re weird political reasons why it didn't happen. Um, but yeah, really I'd say mobile phones, smartphones have been the thing that, that was missing. And of course, back then there were uh, millions of people on the internet actively communicating and not billions of people, so the market for anything was a lot smaller. And the people were kind of boring. Like the, the other weird thing about the cypherpunks is that most of these people, aside from being kind of weird, didn't really have, like they were like Westerners living, they, they made like 100K a year, they lived in places with rule of law, they were generally well protected, so they were thinking about these ideas as a theoretical thing and the thing that they wanted to aspire to, but in reality, they, if they had a problem, they could, they'd have legal recourse, nobody would attack them, everything else. Uh, as the population on the internet has changed, we have people in countries that have no legal system or where they're targets of stuff, so it's a big deal. Okay, they, because many of them lived in Europe, but they were still first world kind of not Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was actually one, yeah, the, the crypto, it was, it was a, a weird split between US and Europe. There were a lot of people like, that were major contributors from Europe, probably at least half, uh, half by the number were Europe and then by quality I'd actually probably say more like 75% um, were outside of the US and mostly, mostly Europe. Um, but there was a very restrictive interpretation of um, cryptography export at the time under ITAR, Vossner Agreement, uh, Arrangement, and uh, other US laws where it was basically impossible for a US person and a foreign person to collaborate on a project in a useful way. Uh, the only way you could do it would be by publishing, um, you could either do a restricted thing like a 40-bit key, which is essentially breakable on a, um, a smartphone now, but it was at the time something that was feasible for a couple of computers to break in a period of time or you had to go through the First Amendment protections in the US and actually publish something to at least 50 people in public and then have them download it, re uh, type it in, um, and then do it. And this is really interesting. Yeah, the PGP so software was developed by Philip Zimmerman and a couple other people in the US and had to get exported from the US in the form of physical books. We have a lot of precedent for you can't restrict people's ability to publish and that's clearly speech, but uh, there wasn't any real precedent for sending binaries out of the country, so it was a pretty exciting thing. So there was a hacker, I think it was HIP, uh, like a place in 97 in the Netherlands where they had a book scanning party where they had, I think it was like 50 books or something, and they scanned them in, they had error correcting code on the page, and that was how the code got out of the US legally to do all this stuff. But yeah, it was, it was pretty weird. Uh, so compared to the past, I would say the mailing list is a non-entity. It basically doesn't exist anymore. Um, the people that were on the list, as well as people that were inspired by some of the ideas, are the people building all the cool tools today. Like Tor Project directly inspired, like the people that are running the Tor Project were people that were from back then or that were inspired by that. Um, everybody working on Bitcoin has a lot of history with that kind of stuff. Um, I think. Some, uh, certainly like the Silk Road people. So it's definitely like an inspiration for this stuff. Uh, in practice, a lot of the developers, like whenever I go to a developer thing, there's a lot of people that um, are like 20 to, like in their 20s. And it's unreasonable that a person in their 20s today would necessarily have been on a mailing list in like 1995. Uh, so there's a lot of people that weren't on the list in its heyday, but I think a lot of the ideas were discussed there and it's pretty good. Uh, I'm not really sure if it was more about the technical side or the political or social side. Um, I think you really needed to have both because without the, um, the ideas of like why you should build these tools, it was unclear why, why do you care about making um, tools like this work on cheap hardware. Um, if you can afford to have an expensive PC and everything else, uh, you don't really care, but then people discussed the activist use case where um, these people didn't have a lot of money. So the, the people that are the, at the most risk are actually the people who have the least resources to defend, and also the idea of disposable devices and everything else. So I think you need to have the ideas behind it, but you clearly need to have the technology. But none of this stuff is finished. It's been a long time.
Yeah. So, yes, the list pretty much split. There was the cryptography, the Met styled list that Perry Metzger ran that was really popular and is still popular. Uh, P2P uh, hackers, a couple of decentralized things. The individual projects got their own list. So um, clearly, the uh, the um, like the Tor project has their internal stuff and a lot of those stuff. Twitter, um, a lot of forums, like forum. It basically, it's, it, things have moved away from email to other forums. Uh, but yeah, it's still there's a lot of active discussion in various places. But cool. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to take questions outside. Cool. Thank you. And thank you.